of 1 Peter. Uh, today I'm going to read through 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We may make it through all that, we may not. Uh, this is a controversial text, and so I ask that you bear with me as we, it may take us a couple of weeks to get through this. And so let's read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. It says this, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, as we said a moment ago, this is a controversial text, and it's really easy to discern that right out of the blocks here when you get to verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now, uh, I want to acknowledge that for the better part of 2,000 years, this is one of those verses that have been used by evil and broken men to subjugate and abuse and exploit women. And I want to say right off the bat that I reject that that this is a misuse of this text, that this text is not intended to give man uh, uh, power over women in a way that can hurt them and use them for their own pleasure and their own ends. Uh, that's a misuse of this text. So that's one reason why this text is sort of hard to swallow. Another reason is we live in a world today that is uh, very egalitarian. We, have to, we tend to reject the ways of old, the categories and the social categories of old, and uh, in some ways that's helpful, in some ways that's to our detriment, but it certainly leads to us having some internal resistance to this when we read about Scripture commanding women to be subject to their husbands, to submit to their husbands. And so um, there are those who, because of these sensitivities, uh, smooth over this text. Um, they say that when it says that women should be subject to their husbands, that what it's not saying is that they should obey them or be slaves to them or something like that, but rather that women should ha practice a deferential respect to their husbands, that women should go above and beyond to love their husbands and to serve them out of their heart, but certainly not to be sub uh, subjected to them or subject to them. And uh, the problem with that is, is, is much, as good as that sounds, that's just not what that word means in the original language. Wherever the word subject has been used, it's about someone having authority over someone else. A few examples of that are Jesus' his parents having authority over him when he was a child, how he was subject to them. Another example is of how Jesus gave authority to his disciples to cast out demons, how demons were subject to the authority of his disciples. And certainly that wouldn't mean a deferential respect or a self-giving love. Uh, that means what it means. It means they had authority over them, over demons. Uh, it also refers to Jesus Christ uh, being subject to God the Father. It refers to citizens uh, of the kingdom of God, being uh, citizens of, of, of society, being subject uh, to civil governments. It, it refers to citizens of the kingdom of God being subject to the authority of God. It always means someone having authority over someone else. And so it makes this text kind of hard to swallow. And so what I want to encourage you with is this. Um, if we have to put our foot down and enforce to our wives men that they submit to us, I would submit to you that maybe something is wrong. I was just looking back in my own life and thinking about the times that I've had to put my foot down with my wife and demand that she submit to me. And fellas, I can't remember any time that I've ever had to do that. In fact, I would submit this to you, that just because the scriptures say that women, wives, should submit to their husbands, doesn't mean that there's some injunction against husbands humbling themselves and going to their wives for advice and counsel 
and them making a decision together about the history, the direction, the, the health of their marriage or their family. There's no verse that says that we can't do that. In fact, I would I commend to you that that would be a wise thing to do. Just in my own experience, the times that we've had big decisions to make for our marriage and our family, uh, it, by and large, my wife has been the one on uh, who's had the discernment and the wisdom and the counsel that I needed to hear so that we could make a decision together. And so I want to submit that to you, that just because it says that wives should submit to their husbands doesn't mean that we shouldn't go to them and receive counsel for them, from them. But further, let's root this a little bit more in the gospel. This is Peter talking here, and we're going to finish with this today. If you would turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to a group of Christians in a place called Ephesus. And he's switching gears and he gets to how to live out their faith in terms of their marriage, just like Peter's doing in 1 Peter chapter 3. And this is what Paul says. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now he's not saying wives should submit to their husbands and in the same way that Christ saves the church, Husbands save their wives. That's not what he's saying here. All he's saying is, is that in the same way that Christ has authority over his church, husbands have a measure of authority over their wives. But it's wrong for us to stop there because this looks like something. So check this out. Now, as the church, in verse 24, submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Let's read on, men. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he's not just giving us this amorphous command to love our wives. I love my wife the way that I can show love. He says love looks like something. And what does love look like? Love looks like the way Christ demonstrated his love for his church. How did Christ demonstrate his love? For his church, his bride, he gave himself up for her. Love looks like something. It's not just a feeling. It is a demonstration. It is an act. Love looks like us men, husbands, giving, our, giving ourselves up, giving up our own interests, giving up our own ambitions, giving up our own desires, giving up our own fantasies and lusts for the sake of our wives. Now, in that context marriage can flourish. Women, wives specifically, should be able to know in their hearts, they should have an assurance that even though they are married to imperfect men, that the men that they are married to live in such a way that they die to themselves, that they sacrifice themselves for the sake of the health of their marriage and their family. My mom used to always say that marriage is two deaths and one resurrection. That's what marriage is. And that's the only way that this can work. Men, if we are not loving our wives the way that God has called us to love our wives, then the command for women to submit to their husbands, for wives to submit to their husbands, is going to be too hard for them. We must lower ourselves in the same way that Jesus lowered himself. And I don't mean condescend to ladies as though they're less than us. I'm talking about us humbling ourselves making ourselves small, adopting the same posture that John the Baptist had when he said, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. This is the posture that we are to bring into our relationship with our wives. Paul goes on to say this. He goes on to describe what it looks like for Jesus to love his church. And he says this in the beginning of verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her, by the washing of water with the word. Think about the terminology used there, the gentleness, the care, the tenderness there, the washing of water, not the belittling, not the demeaning, not the shaming and the fussing, not the nagging, but the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church as he's treasuring the church. He wants to show off the church so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And then look what he says here. This is incredible. 
in verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives like their own bodies. In the same way that Christ tenderly washes his church, husbands should tenderly serve their own wives. And then when Paul thinks about what all this means, he says this in verse 32. This mystery is profound, the mystery of marriage. He says, this mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So what he's saying here is something incredible, that God put the husband and the wife together and they become one in marriage. And the way that the husband serves and sacrifices himself for the wife and the way the wife submits to her husband is a picture of, of the gospel, of God's love for us. This is what we should be striving for. So I would say to all of you men out there who are listening to this, when you think about that verse that wives should submit to their husbands, what we should be thinking about more than that is how we can sacrifice ourselves for our wives so that we can be a demonstration to the world of God's eternal, unbreakable love for us his church, and his love for all the world. The way that we do marriage should preach the gospel. The way that we do marriage should preach the gospel. We're going to finish delving into this text next week. There's a lot more to say about it. Until then, thanks for bearing with me for a few minutes longer. I encourage you to read this text and study this text and think on it, pray about it, and get ready for next week. God bless you, my friends. I love you. Have a great, great week and weekend.